Neely's Creek and whoever else, I'm about to call us to worship. Now, I remember when I was a kid in school, I would watch the clock and that would be from the classroom looking to get out of the classroom. And there was a certain point in time when a bell would ring and I would be free. I don't know how many of you anticipate the call to worship in such a way, but in reality, it is a good bit like that call of that bell to freedom. So when I call us to worship, this is what we can do, this is what we will do, this is what we must do. Put the world aside. Understand that we are limited, God is not. Understand that we are powerless, God is not. Understand that we are dependent and that he provides. Understand that we are not worthy of praise ourselves, but we are those who are equipped to praise he who is worthy, the Lord God Almighty. So, Neely's Creek and whoever else, I call us now to worship, and I do so, extolling God's blessing and his characteristics and truth from his word, Psalm 67. May God be gracious to us and bless us and make his face to shine upon us, that your way may be known on earth, your saving power among all nations, let the people praise you, O God. Let all the people praise you. Let the nations be glad and sing for joy, for you judge the peoples with equity and guide the nations upon the earth. Let the peoples praise you, O God. Let all the peoples praise you. The earth has yielded its increase. God, our God, shall bless us. God shall bless us. Let all the ends of the earth fear him. Let's pray. Father, as your people have been called to worship, as we are now gathered in Jesus' name, I ask that you would attend to us by your spirit and by your word. I pray that you would receive your due glory and honor from your people at this time. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Join us in singing our first hymn this morning. We gather together. Gather together to watch the Lord's blessing. He chastens and chastens his will to make known the wicked oppressing now cease from distressing. Sing praises to his name, he forgets not. Our God with us joining, ordaining, maintaining His kingdom divine. So from the beginning, the fight we were winning. The Lord was at our side. All pray, whenever we pray, we are again free to acknowledge that we are those who at times are in need, those who are dependent, those who are not strong in themselves, those who need God. And he has promised that he is near, that he is present, that he inclines his ear to hear the cries of his people, the prayers of his people, the desires of his people. So let's go to the Lord now together in a time of prayer. Pray with me. 
Father, again, this is your day, and we are your people, wherever you have situated us. Here again, gathered in Jesus' name, and coming before you in prayer. Father, we know that we are yours because we have been paid for, we have been bought, and that with a price that is... Mm. Hard to imagine, but true nonetheless. Uh, the blood of Christ. Father, at least let that inform us that we are indeed very valuable to you. Thus, our words are very precious to your ears. Lord, our sin would be rightly hated by you and rightly condemned by you, for it would cost us our lives, and we have already determined you have already determined that we are precious to you. And so you have worked it such that our sin would be separated from us and the curse that comes with it. And that was done on the cross. Lord, we revel in this and we recognize here that we must confess to you our sin. So Father, may we rush to do so. May our love of sin be turned to hatred. May our dependence upon that which is not of you and which does not bring you praise or glory be, be broken. Lord, we need your help even in this. So would you assist us now to confess to you our sin in the quiet of our hearts. Father, hear our prayers of confession. Father, you have told us in your word that a contrite heart is acceptable to you. And thus we would confess our sins and have, and Lord, you have heard, and you are faithful and you are just, and you have promised to forgive our sins. So Lord, may we know ourselves to be your people here on earth whose sins are forgiven. May that create within us a joy that is irrepressible and that is indeed expressible and that we would express such a thing that our boasting would be not in ourselves, not in any righteousness that we might think to boast, for we have none, but rather in our risen Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. And Father, as we are now worshiping in his name and praying in his name, as it is in him that we live and move and have our being, Lord, you have given us one another as your church, and so I would pray for your church. I'd pray now for your church's leadership as we have decision, decisions in front of us. We would seek your wisdom. We would seek your spirit, and that you would grant wisdom uh, and, and unity for the sake of your church going forward. Father, for those needs that are present in the church, be they financial or relational or physical, I ask that you are near and present. And perhaps at times, where appropriate, where necessary, in the person of your people who are serving one another in, again, Jesus' name. Father, would you let us know our calling even more every day in finer and finer detail. May we know the joy of serving in Jesus' name. May you show us opportunities that are specified for us, for our gifts, where we might meet them individually or together as a church, that we would be active in loving one another and in loving this world. Father, for those who have suffered not only illness, but perhaps loss in this time, I pray that you are a comfort. Lord, for those new lives that are on the way, I pray for continued protection for the little ones that we anticipate meeting here soon, and there are a good many of them. I pray for your blessing upon each one of them, on the mothers that are carrying them, on the recent arrival, those, that family at least. Um, Father, again, I pray that you would guide us in this time to be uplifting one another in prayer, serving where and when we can. And then, Lord, as your people again constituted and put on this earth, I pray that we would be busy about the task of praying for those who are in leadership generally for those who govern us uh, locally, nationally, and then for those who are governing in other portions of the globe. I pray also there that you would produce uh, wisdom and that it would be recognized as such. 
Lord, I pray that there would be a humbling of ourselves in order to pray for those who would be perceived as enemy. May we recognize that we do not fight against flesh and blood, but against the powers and the principalities and the spirits of darkness. We are the children of light. Father, may we understand our position here as those who belong to your kingdom first. May we carry ourselves such. Grant us that strength. Grant us that wisdom. Grant us that power. May we be light. May we be salt. I pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Uh, Thank goodness that we don't only pray when we are gathered here together. My goodness, are there ever so many rabbit trails of legitimate prayers that need to be prayed. And here, we don't go after them all. But throughout the day, throughout the week, throughout our lifetime as Christians, may we be those who continually find ourselves praying individually, together, certainly as a church, Lord willing, together as a church. We're going to turn now to the reading of God's Word. We're in a sermon series. The sermon series is in the first five books of the Bible, the Pentateuch. The first of those is Genesis, and today we're in Genesis chapter 26. So I'm turning there in my own Bible. As I do that, I issue a challenge to those who are watching, wherever you are watching, um, at home or on the sea or in outer space. Hopefully you have a copy of God's Word with you. I'd challenge the head of the house at this point to read Genesis chapter 26. If you would rather I read it or need me to read it for you, that's good and that's fine and I will do so now. So this is God's word. It is holy. It is inspired. It is infallible. Genesis chapter 26 beginning at verse 1. Now there was a famine in the land besides the former famine that was in the days of Abraham. And Isaac went to Gerar, to Abimelech, king of the Philistines. And the Lord appeared to him and said, Do not go down to Egypt. Dwell in the land of which I shall tell you. Sojourn in this land, and I will be with you and will bless you. For to you and to your offspring I will give all these lands. And I will establish the oath that I swore to Abraham your father. I will multiply your offspring as the stars of heaven and will give to your offspring all these lands. And in your offspring, all the nations of the earth shall be blessed because Abraham obeyed my voice and kept my charge, my commandments, my statutes and my laws. So Isaac settled in Gerar. When the men of the place asked him about his wife, he said, she is my sister. For he feared to say, my wife, thinking, lest the men of the place should kill me because of Rebekah, because she was attractive in appearance. When he had been there a long time, Abimelech, king of the Philistines, looked out of a window and saw Isaac laughing with Rebekah, his wife. So Abimelech called Isaac and said, behold, she is your wife. How then could you say she is my sister? Isaac said to him, Because I thought lest I die because of her. Abimelech said, What is this you have done to us? One of the people might easily have lain with your wife, and you would have brought guilt upon us. So Abimelech warned all the people, saying, Whoever touches this man or his wife shall surely be put to death. And Isaac sowed in that land and reaped in the same year a hundredfold. The Lord blessed him. And the man became rich and gained more and more until he became very wealthy. He had possessions of flocks and herds and many servants so that the Philistines envied him. Now the Philistines had stopped and filled with earth all the wells that his father's servants had dug in the days of Abraham, his father. And Abimelech said to Isaac, go away from us, for you are much mightier than we. So Isaac departed from there and encamped in the valley of Gerar and settled there. And Isaac dug again the wells of water that had been dug in the days of Abraham his father, which the Philistines had stopped after the death of Abraham. And he gave them the names that his father had given them. 
But when Isaac's servants dug in the valley and found there was a well of spring water, the herdsmen of Gerar quarreled with Isaac's herdsmen, saying, The water's ours. So he called the name of the well Essek, because they contended with him. Then they dug another well, and they quarreled over that also, so he called its name Sitna. And he moved from there and dug another well, and they did not quarrel over it. So he called its name Rehoboth, saying, For now the Lord has made room for us, and we shall be fruitful in the land. From there he went up to Be'er Sheba, and the Lord appeared to him the same night and said, I am the God of Abraham, your father. Fear not, for I am with you and will bless you and multiply your offspring for my servant Abraham's sake. So he built an altar there and called upon the name of the Lord and pitched his tent there. And there Isaac's servants dug a well. When Abimelech went to him from Gerar with Ahuzah his advisor and Phicol the commander of his army, Isaac said to them, Why have you come to me, seeing that you hate me and have sent me away from you? They said, We see plainly that the Lord has been with you. So we said, Let there be a sworn pact between us, between you and us, and let us make a covenant with you, that you will do us no harm, just as we have not touched you and have done to you nothing but good and have sent you away in peace. You are now the blessed of the Lord. So he made them a feast. And they ate and drank. In the morning they rose early and exchanged oaths. And Isaac sent them on their way, and they departed from him in peace. That same day Isaac's servants came and told him about the well that they had dug and said to him, We have found water. He called it Sheba. Therefore the name of the city is Be'er Sheba to this day. When Esau was 40 years old, he took Judith, the daughter of Be'eri, the Hittite, to be his wife, and Basimoth, the daughter of Elon, the Hittite. And they made life bitter for Isaac and Rebekah. Here ends the reading of God's word. May it be a blessing to his people. Okay. Uh, if you're like me, at times in life, you have questions. If you are like me, those times arise about every day, um, maybe even multiple times a day. I'm just, I'm just going to take it as a given that you are at least somewhat like me. All right, one of the questions that I've settled and doesn't come up for me very much, but if we are attending to God's word, one of the questions that I think we are responsible to ask and have settled is this, is there a God? Let me answer according to my own faith, but my own faith is going to come from God's word, so let me answer according to God's word. Yes, yes, there's a God. Does God speak? Is he a person? Yes, yes. It's how it, the very book begins, the whole thing begins. That's why it's important to know not only the Bible, but all of the Bible and how it begins. Genesis, this is where God, in fact, who exists, speaks. And creation comes about. All right. Let's move further. Does God speak to bless? Again, yes. Yes, he does. And would that be found in his word? It would. Where would that be found? Genesis chapter 12, verses 1, 2, 3. Who is he talking to? He's talking to Abraham. And indeed, he speaks to bless. Not just Abraham, but all families on earth, all nations on earth through Abraham. So if we are seeking God's blessings, we do very well to seek him through his word and then to see where these blessings have then been spoken and we found them spoken to Abraham. Does God also speak to curse? Good question. How pers perspicuous of you to ask that. In those same verses, Genesis chapter 12, specifically verse 3, God also does promise to curse those who would curse Abraham. Hmm, that's sobering and very important. And he is very gracious to give us then his word for the times when we have these questions. Further questions, particularly as we are meeting yet again like this. Does trouble arise at times? 
Yes, we don't need God's word to uh, verify that, but in fact, God's word does verify that from beginning to end. Yes, trouble arises from without and from within. Shall I turn that into a question? All right, let me do that. Does trouble sometimes arise from without? For example, a famine or a plague or a war? Yes. Would we be maybe in a time right now of some level, at least, of plague? I think so. And so, yes, trouble does come from without, from outside ourselves. Question next. I haven't numbered these. Does trouble sometimes rise from within? Oh, don't do this to me, Pastor. Oh, goodness gracious, my family's sitting here. Don't do this to me. Does trouble sometimes rise from within? Is there sometimes sin? Again, yes, very evident. It doesn't need to be dwelt on very long to know that that's the case. Last question. Does the trouble from without, does the trouble from within negate God's voice, negate God's blessing? No, it doesn't. God speaks and he promises to bless. And that blessing will come because he himself has determined to bless in the way that he has determined to bless through the ones that he has determined to bring the blessing through and he will see it through. So here we are in Genesis 26. We're in the second half of Genesis. We are more than halfway done with Genesis already. In the last chapter, chapter 25, we understood that there is a transfer of this ongoing promise of blessing from Abraham to Isaac, his son. And the chapter ended with twins being born to Isaac, Jacob and Esau. And one of them is the one through whom this blessing is going to come, and that's, well, Jacob. But that is to be saved. Chapter 26 is Genesis' account of Isaac. He doesn't have much press as far as Genesis goes, but there is in Genesis 26 the account of Isaac and the fact that his blessing is Abraham's blessing, is the blessing that God has promised in the beginning and still stands today. So what do we receive from this entirety of the chapter? Well, let's reiterate God's blessing to Isaac. Because for those who are going to be blessed by God, this is where that blessing is going to come, and we do well to keep our eyes there. So he says in verse 3, this is God speaking to Isaac, I will be with you, and I will bless you, for to you and to your offspring I will give all these lands, and I will establish the oath that I swore to Abraham your father. I will multiply your offspring as the stars of the heaven, and will give to your offspring all these lands, and in your offspring, all the nations of the earth shall be blessed. This, again, is God's word. This is his prerogative. This is what he is about in the history of the world, including this moment now. So if there's going to be blessing, we need to understand that it's coming from God and it's coming through Isaac. And so what does this blessing look like? And is there any possibility that we could have a part in this? even though at this time we are perhaps uh, suffering in a way that we are unaccustomed to, and we would very much want there to be a blessing, a word that holds and that we can hold to. What happens in this chapter with Isaac? Well, he receives that blessing from God. God tells him, you go to Gerar. Don't go to Egypt like Abraham your father did, and Isaac listens, he obeys. And then he pulls a fast one on Abimelech, and he does just like Abraham, and he says, my wife is my sister. Well, what happens then? The king finds out about this, and Isaac is chastised, but what happens to Isaac? The king issues a royal proclamation that Isaac will be protected in that land. Nobody may touch him. Nobody, nobody may touch his wife, Rebekah, or they will be killed. This is God making sure that his blessing is coming about and he is making sure that those who will carry the blessing are indeed protected, even if trouble from within has been evidenced, even if trouble from without, he went to Gerar because of a famine, 
has been evidenced. God is going to see this through. So here's Isaac now living under a royal decree of protection. What happens next? He goes out into the field and he sows some seeds. What happens next? He reaps 100 fold in the sight then of everybody in the area. Now they're referred to as the Philistines. And it is evident to them that Isaac is blessed by the Lord. He is becoming wealthier and wealthier. He is becoming more powerful such that they say, go away from us. They recognize his blessing. They recognize that they're living in the same area. They're doing the same things that he's doing. Something is different with this guy. And they are afraid, probably not of this guy. They are recognizing the power of the Lord at work in this man's life. And they say, go away from us. He goes away. Now he needs some water. He redigs a well. There's some water. It's taken away. He moves on. He digs another well. There's some water. It's taken away. He moves on. He digs another well. He can't dig a well without there being water in the well. It keeps coming. God is going to make sure that he is sustained. And everything that he's been given is also sustained. And now the Philistines have a different perspective. They recognize that he is blessed by the Lord. They recognized that they would do well to associate themselves in a positive way with the one who is blessed by the Lord. This is wisdom. This is for the sake of their own livelihood. This is for the sake of their own lives. This is for the sake of the life of their nation. They would seek that blessing or at least avoid the curse that would be the other side of that blessing coming from that same God. So here they come. And what do they say about Isaac to Isaac? They said, verse 28, we see plainly that the Lord has been with you. So we said, let there be a sworn pact between us, between you and us, and let us make a covenant with you that you will do us no harm, just as we have not touched you and have done to you nothing but good and have sent you away in peace. You are now the blessed of the Lord. This is God's word. They have spoken, but this is God's word. And this is God's word to everybody. As they are looking to Isaac, it does us very good to look to Isaac as well. Anybody who at any point would look to be blessed by the Lord ought to look to Isaac here. Isaac is gracious. He cuts a covenant with these guys and he sends them on their way in peace. We're going to get back to Jacob and Esau. And so there's Esau at the end of the chapter. Uh, we'll pick him up there in, in, in next week. Lord willing, unless Jesus comes back. Okay. But when we're looking at Isaac, well, if this is your first time with us, I'm going to bring us back to something we've already learned. And as God is determined to bring his blessing to his people, there is a certain way that he's going to do that. It starts with Abraham. It moves to Isaac. But where does it move from that point forward? All right, Matthew, we're going to the Gospels, starting with the first one there. Matthew, chapter 1, verse 1. The book of the genealogy of Jesus Christ, the son of David, the son of Abraham. Next verse, Abraham was the father of Isaac, and Isaac the father of Jacob, and thus begins the genealogy which culminates in the arrival of Jesus Christ. Now... This is the one by whom and through whom and in whom all of the blessings of God are put forward, not just now, but forever. And thus, if anybody has sought God's blessing, it's very clear in Genesis 26, it has gone from Abraham to Isaac. And then if we would be faithful to God's word, we will find him always faithful to us. We follow Isaac and the whole trail is there in Matthew chapter one, if you're very curious, but I've cut right to the end. And that is that here comes Jesus Christ. The Lord has kept his promise. He is faithful from generation to generation. His love is steadfast. And so we can rejoice in this. If we are already his people, if he has given us the grace to see this and further than that, to believe this, then in anything, in sickness or in health, in life or in death, in wealth or in poverty, we can be assured that everything really is okay. And everything is going to be okay. And it isn't because of us. It is because of 
what has been made of us, what has been promised to us, what has been given to us in Jesus Christ, right? So for those who do not yet know this, I am just putting forward, this is simply what God says. I'm going to bless all families. I'm going to bless all nations in the Lord Jesus Christ. That second part of that, Genesis 12, 3, is then the curse. Whoever blesses you, I will bless. Whoever curses you or rejects you, I will curse or I will reject. So there is a very strong call to put that faith, to come into that covenant with this offspring of Isaac, Jesus Christ. God is so gracious as to cut a covenant with those who were situated as enemies, such as the Philistines were uh, to Isaac and would prove to be in years to come. But this is God's grace. This is God's goodness. This is God's love evident in Jesus. So what do we do when we recognize again today that God's plan hasn't been upset? God's plan hasn't been slowed down or sped up. God's plan is proceeding exactly as he would have it. And his desire is indeed to bless and to save, to provide that which is necessary, not just for life, but for eternal life. So last week we finished in Romans chapter 9. This week I'm bringing us to Romans chapter 10 and we'll finish there. I'm going to start reading from verse 9. And again, for any who would seek God's blessing, you will find it given in the Lord Jesus Christ, and here we have the so what. Romans 10, 9. If you confess with your mouth that Jesus is Lord and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. For with the heart one believes and is justified, and with the mouth one confesses and is saved. For the scripture says, everyone who believes in him will not be put to shame. For there is no distinction between Jew and Greek, for the same Lord is Lord of all, bestowing his riches on all who call on him. For everyone who calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. Period. Take a look around you. Have you confessed with your mouth that Jesus is Lord? You're saved. Are things going well? You're saved. Are things going terribly? You're saved. Fear not. Take a look around you, those of you who have not confessed with your mouth and have not believed in your heart. You're not saved. And thus, even if this world is going as well as it possibly can, it is going to be coming to an end. This is not our home. This is not a permanent place. And so we are given, I think, a right recognition of, a right reminder of our mortality at this time, hopefully to get us to think about immortality, hopefully to get us to understand that this life is fleeting, that time is flying, and that there is a God who speaks and who blesses and who curses and who is calling people to faith in his Son, Jesus Christ, dead, buried, resurrected, ascended. And so if you have at this point recognized that your power isn't sufficient, that your knowledge isn't sufficient, that your grasp of the future isn't sufficient, that you yourself are unable to produce that which is needed for an abundant life and certainly not for an eternal life of blessing. Well, God's anticipated your need. And he's made himself known to you. And so the call here is for you to put your faith in this one through whom comes God's blessing now and forevermore, the Lord Jesus Christ. It's in his name that we've gathered to worship, and it is in his name that we now pray. Pray with me. Father, I ask simply that you would assure your people of their salvation. I ask that we would look to you for every blessing, and when we recognize every blessing as having come from you, that we would be quick to return thanks to give you blessing. And Father, as we are called to be people through whom your blessing is evident, I pray that it would be evident and that others would see 
that we are possessed by a joy that is irrepressible, a hope that is irrepressible, and Lord, that that would not only be attractive, not repulsive, attractive, that we would then be able to put forward um, he who is our hope, Jesus Christ, in whose name we pray and by whom and through the gospel of whom you are still calling people to salvation in this world at this time. Father, may your name be praised. We ask in Jesus' name. Amen. Join us in singing How Firm a Foundation. How firm a foundation, ye saints of the Lord, is laid for your faith in his excellent word. What more can he say than to you he hath said, to you who for refuse to Jesus have fled? Fear not, I am with thee, O be not dismayed, for I am thy God. And I still give thee aid. I'll strengthen thee, help thee, and cause thee to stand. Upheld by my righteous, omnipotent hand. When through fiery trials thy pathway shall shall be thy supply. The flame shall not hurt thee, I only design thy dross to consume and thy gold to refine. The soul that on Jesus hath People of God, receive now the benediction. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face to shine upon you and be merciful unto you. The Lord lift up his countenance upon you and give you peace. Amen.